you. Um, so we have four research papers in this session and we have one and a half hour. That means each paper can have a maximum 20 minutes for the presentation and we'll, we'll have Q&A session for a couple of minutes. So the first paper is soft engineering for autonomous robot challenges, progresses and opportunities. And it'll be presented by uh, Sho Wang. So you can proceed to share your screen and give the presentation, please. Sho Wang, I believe that you are here. Okay, now we can see now your screen, so you can go ahead. Hello everyone, I'm Bong Shuo from Key Lab of Software Engineering for Complex Systems of NUDT from China. Today I'll give my presentation of the paper Software Engineering for Autonomous Robot Challenges, Progresses, and Opportunities. Uh, I will give my presentation from the four aspects first. Background Autonomous Robot is essentially a software intensive cyber physical system that integrates hardware, devices, and software systems operating in open environments with autonomous behaviors to accomplish its tasks without human intervention. And Autonomous Robot Sales Software uh, ARS is important, but its development is difficult uh, for it how to integrate software development technologies and robotics empathize uh, and the software requirements is complex are complex and uh, there are many <coughs> openness and uncertainty issues of the situated environments and lastly the specific software requirements like safety, real-time autonomy is also difficult to handle. And uh, software engineering for autonomous robot SE for AR becomes indispensable to support the efficient, low-cost, high-quality development of ARS and there with its Comple complexity and has made many progresses in safety oriented software engineering process, software architectures, model driven development, uh, robotic development environment, and uh, software framework design and domain engineering. However, there is still a lack of global view and a comprehensive analysis on the challenges, progresses, and opportunities of researches and the progresses of SE4ER. Oh. Okay, I will First, let's look at the challenges of SE4AR. Um, uh, there are two specific features and complexities of ARS. Uh, from the external viewpoint, we can see the complexities of environments, and from the internal viewpoint, there are ex uh, complexities of requirements. 
there are three software engineering challenges as you see uh, from uh, external or, or and uh, internal viewpoints. Uh, sec, 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 sec one, how to design and implement ARS. Uh, sec two, how to support the engineering development of ARS. And sec three, how to assure the quality of ARS. According to the technique characteristics and research properties existing, uh, researches can be divided into the following correlated directions. Uh, let, let's look at the uh, figure. The relationships among the research directions of SE4 here. We can see there are five directions. Robotic software supporting platform uh, supports the direction model driven development, and it depends on the robotic software architecture and the construction te technology. And uh, these two directions depends on the uh, software quality assurance and uh, each of uh, research directions aim to tackle specific challenges we can look at this table the correlation between the research directions and the challenges of SE4AR and the uh, plus symbol means strong correlation and the minus symbol means weak correlation and we can divide the robotic software architecture into four parts uh, data center architecture, decentralized architecture, hierarchical uh, architecture, and hybrid architecture. And uh, uh, it comes with construction technology of ARS. Uh, uh, we can see there are four parts program ma model. Uh, program paradigms and languages, software component technology, and open source software, uh, aka OSS. Uh, for program model, there are structured model, OO model, uh, component based model, reactive model, and agent based model. And for programming paradigms and languages, there are imperative programming, descriptive programming, hybrid programming. And, uh, for the third uh, uh, direction, model-driven development of ARS, there, uh, we can see we have to use mat meta models to describe the domain language. And uh, uh, based on the meta models, we can use domain-specific language DSL or architectural de description language ADL to, uh, to uh, to describe uh, 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 the model uh, uh, designed by ma meta models, and uh, lastly, we have to use domain ontologies to uh, implement this model to uh, a specific codes. And for the uh, for, fourth uh, direction, software quality assurance of autonomous robots. Uh, we can use software testing. There are software testing, static analysis models, goes uh, dynamic analysis, diagnosis, and repair, and uh, formal method to assurance the quality of software uh, for autonomous robot. And uh, for the last uh, uh, direction mm -hmm. is the supporting platform of ARS. Uh, uh, we can see uh, for the uh, fr a framework of middleware. There are po uh, popular iOS, uh, export core, or uh, YARP. Uh, these uh, tools uh, for the toolkit or environment. There, are Microsoft Robotics Developer Studio or Chography uh, to design uh, design ARS for no robot, <coughs> and there. Is a hybrid platform like uh, Oracle or Autorobot. Uh, then I will give uh, our discussions about the uh, drawbacks of current researches or opportunities of future researches. Uh, first, uh, 
Uh, current research is lack effective strategies, processes, methods, and tools to systematically support uh, complex software requirements for autonomous robots. Uh, for this issue, we can establish robotic <laughs> ontologies, identify the variable environment elements and uh, invariable features across domain applications and borrow the successful development and practices. And uh, secondly, current uh, researchers lack the processes and structures for software business e ecosystem in robotics. Uh, to handle with this issue, a uh, robotics development methodology or process mo model uh, are necessary to present a comprehensive and systematic support for software development developers and uh, robotics experts develop ERS. And uh, uh, thirdly, uncertainty issues resulting from the complicated environments is also uh, one part of drawbacks of current uh, researches. And, uh, uh, so we so more software engineering uh, technologies especially for autonomous robots should be developed and uh, fourthly ethical problems safety assurance and uh, certification security and privacy uh, and uh, professional education is also uh, pose uh, uh, many challenges uh, so technology standardization of AI should be enhanced to to for these problems and lastly current researches also lack solid theoretical foundations uh, so establishing solid theoretical and technical foundation for engineering ARS is uh, necessary uh, finally I will give uh, the conclusions of this paper uh, this paper presents a global view on SE for ARs challenges progresses and opportunities and against the following threshold uh, threefold, threefold contributions first <coughs> It identified three software engineering changes by analyzing the complexities of ARS and its situated environments. And uh, secondly, it summarizes existing research progresses of SE for AR from five main research directions. And lastly, it discusses a number of drawbacks in current researches in SE for AR and point, pointing out several future research opportunities. Thanks. Any questions? Okay, so thank you for the presentation. So we have uh, one question posted on, on the uh, chat, chat room. So uh, the question is um, whether you can explain the aims of the five correlated research directions that you explained in a separate manner. I think in, in other words, so what are the goals of those uh, five different research directions? Uh, yes, uh, thank, thanks for your question. And uh, 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 let me explain for this question. Uh, first, uh, for the uh, robotic software architecture, uh, it, it aims to uh, pr present a, a high level uh, architecture and uh, styles for ARS to implement its uh, uh, software requirements and uh, uh, assure the software quality uh, by el elaborating, uh, it will elaborate uh, various trade off on uh, organization decomposition uh, of software components, uh, their coordination and interaction uh, with the environment. And for the second uh, direction, is uh, uh, the construction technology. Uh, or ARS, uh, uh, it mainly pr pr presents uh, enabling and a low level uh, software development uh, uh, 
uh, technologies to de design and uh, implement the software requirements of AIS. And for the mod model driven uh, development uh, uh, aka MDD or uh, uh, MDD or AIS, it, it presents uh, model based methods, methods to build uh, different uh, abstraction level mo models. Uh, like uh, ro ro robotic uh, specific and uh, platform independent models, uh, and uh, it uh, supports the autonom uh, automatic generations of models and codes. Uh, 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 in terms of model transformation, uh, 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 for the for the uh, for, 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 uh, direction, uh, is software quality assurance. Uh, it, it, it its main purposes are to guarantee the quality of software uh, act, artifacts and the development process uh, of ARS. Uh, uh, it, it ranges from software testing, simulation, and uh, static uh, analysis, uh, also oh, and and also for methods, uh, uh, random diagnosis and. Uh, uh, safety oriented software engineering, uh, etc. And for the last uh, direction is uh, a robotic software supporting platform. It provides uh, the uh, automatic or semi automatic platforms uh, uh, to support the development, uh, uh, deployment, running, and uh, uh, evolution of AIS uh, in terms of reusable. It will reuse many software artifacts and uh, software toolkits, uh, and uh, therefore it will decrease decreases the developers' efforts to uh, 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 decreases uh, the developers' efforts and uh, improve the software quality and uh, development product, uh, productivity. Yeah, that's. Uh, uh, th that's our explanation for this question. Okay, thank you very much for the answer. Um, are there any other questions? Okay, um, then uh, wh what are the most uh, unique characteristics of the software for the autonomous robots, do you think? Uh, the most uh, unique, I think, is uh, the the most uh, unique uh, characteristics is is is, is uh, the autonomous robot how to interact uh, with uh, with people in environments and uh, and uh, uh, and uh, usually the environments are very difficult to model and uh, there are many uncertainties uh, in in the environment you you have difficulty to to handle with this. Uh, these, these uncertainties. I think the, this is the most unique uh, characteristic. Yeah, and, and also I think uh, we need to understand human beings, right? Yes, yes. How uh, human beings want to interact with the robots, right? Yes, most uh, uh, most of the uh, unique, <clears throat> most of the uncertainties are coming from people uh, because you, you, you have to know uh, the people in the environments there their intention, their desire, uh, uh, it is hard to capture. Yeah. Okay, thank you very uh, much. So, thank you. All right, great talk, thank you. And the second paper is synthesizing cooperative controllers from global tasks of multi-robot systems. It's also about the robots. And fortunately, we have the speaker uh, now um, so, um, who's the speaker of this paper? Um, Rui Li is the pay of this speaker? Yes, yes. Okay, I'm so here. then now you can go ahead. Okay. Can you, can you see a cigarette? Okay, so we can see your screen. Okay, okay. Here I go. So why don't you uh, switch to the presentation mode? Can I speak now? Okay.
Okay, please okay. go ahead. Uh, okay. Hello, everyone. I'm a student from the National University of Defense Technology, and my name is Nire. The topic of my report today is sensors and cooperative controllers from global tasks of multi robot systems. A cooperative control of multi robot system is a difficult problem. Designers not only consider a control of a single robot, but also consider the communication and the cooperation between robots. There are, this problem are difficult and error prone if they are solved manually. This report provides a solution to about problems. Next, I will divide it into four parts to explain my method step by step. First, I will introduce reactive system synthesis. Reactive systems are open systems that interact with the environment, such as robots, drones, operating systems, and network protocols. It is difficult and error prone to design such a system to meet a certain property specifications. Reactive synthesis provides a method to automatic automatically synthesize a system that meeting the specifications. Designers only need to write the specifications that the system needed to meet. And the, and the construction process is automatically. The process can be same as a game between environment and the system. If the system can process any inputs of the environment while meeting the specification, it can win. And the algorithm will give more control strategy that makes the system win. In this paper, we use GR1 synthesis, which is a subset of nair temper, temper logic. And the GR1 synthesis requires GR1 specification. GR1 specification is divided into three parts, environment input variables, system output variables, and uh, environment assumptions and system guarantees. Environment assumptions capture the initial, con initial condition, phi EI, transition relation, phi ET, go, phi EG of the environment. System guarantees character the initial condition, phi SI, transition relation, phi ST, go, phi SG of the system. Using the GR1 synthesis algorithm can help the system construct a control strategy. Phi E and the Phi S are environment assumptions and the system guarantees respectively. And the algorithm will construct the game structure G and solve the game structure by symbolic mu calculus algorithm. If the specification is realizable, which means the system wins the environment, then the algorithm will construct a, a strategy, which is an automata. <laughs> If a specification is unrealizable, there, then there is no system control strategy. This part is a case of a single robot. The robot has a task specification, which contain environment assumptions and system guarantees. The specific specification allows the robot to patrol workspace shown as this figure, and the specification is captures as a fat SG. And uh, if there is a person or a fire, the robots will to alarm. And uh, if it is alarming, it will stay where it is uh, forever. When extending single robot to multi robots, multiple robots, we consider that one robot may become part of the environment of other robots. We have two methods. The first is to use local specification method. The other writes specification for each robot and then synthesize them respectively. In this case, the designer needs to manually design the connection between the robots. In robot one, the specification needs to 
specify that the robot one need to sense senses catch action location of robot two. When there are conflicts between local tasks, this method can still synthesize two local controls, but the, but the execution path of the two robots may not be what the designer expects. For example, in this case, robot one assume that robot, that robot two will do catch infinitely often, infinitely often, but uh, in robot two, Kench will never trigger, which exactly violates the assumption in robot one. This paper proposes a global specification method, which can automatically synthesize local control strategies for each robot and the communication strategy. To avoid running a runtime deadlock, we propose a centralized Centralization method. It can it can help robots to complete the given global tasks without a deadlock. Our specific our specification is divided into two parts. One part is a multi robot system model. Uh, the multi robot system mo model named Delta. Delta contains. Sensor proposition, actuator proposition uh, of, of all robots in the multi robot system. For example, robot one, robot two, and robot three. Actually, there are communication propositions, but the designer does not need to manually design the communication proposition. The second part of the specification is a task. The task is actually the environment assumption and system guarantees. You can think of multi-robot tasks as single robot tasks. So it, it, it is very easy to write. The complete specification is on the right. Next, local strategy for each robot and a communication strategy need to be synthesized. First, we use GR1 to synthesize a global control strategy AG and project AG onto each, each robot by means of automata projection and generate local sketches for each robot. Then refine the sketches to obtain the available local strategies and uh, communication strategies. The process of projecting on a robot can be seen as can be seen as area in the global strategy from information that does not belong to the robot. For, for example, cracks is from robot one, pull holes is from robot two. They are not belong to robot three. So after projecting, there is no cracks in local sketch AP3. So as uh, potholes, the sketches obtain, obtained are unavailable strategies. In other words, the next the next system output cannot be determined according to the environment input. For example, the environment input is ready to be true, but the repair cracks cannot be determined. This is a local sketch. We use data debug method to obtain additional input information to help system determine the next output. This method can obtain the minimum set of variables to help the sketches become available. The variables in this set are proposition variables from other robots. In other words, these variables are communication variables or communication propositions. For example, running cracks is from robot one, running potholes is from robot two. Therefore, the data debug repairs local sketches also helps us determine the communication variables for each robot. 
from this to this. As shown, there are certain dependence. <coughs> the communication variables of each robot implicitly express a communication strategy, as shown in this figure. There are certain dependencies between robots which may cause deadlock during runtime. For example, in a communication strategy, robots of the same strongly connected component need to be communicated with each other to obtain the other's next system outputs in order to determine their own system output. But the information of them is uncertain, which leads to deadlock. For example, robot one needs to ask robot two whether it will do warning port holes. Meanwhile, robot two needs to ask needs to ask robot one whether it will do warning cracks. But both of them do not do not know what to do next, which means which makes them deadlock. In this case, the satisfiability of the position position needed to be solved to determine the system output of the robot in the same strongly con connected component. For example, there are two local strategies. One is X and the next is, is Y. We assume that X is in the state X1 and Y is in the state Y1. And we assume that current environment put is E to be true. Obviously, X and Y are inter interdependent because X need A4 from Y and Y need A2 from X. We use proposition formulas to encode the next state and its, and its corresponding input. This part encodes the state X2 and this part encodes, the, encodes its corresponding environment input. And the re relationship between states uses or operation. And the relationship between robots use and operation. And th th this, this part is the environment input. We use a set solver to solve the formula and get a solution which means we have determined what X and Y will do next. For example, X3 is the next state, is the next state. Y2 is the next state, according to the environment input. There are two specific centralization methods. The first is based on set solution. This method first start from the bottom strongly connected component to solve the set problem and gradually determine the system output for of, of all robots upward. For example, in this picture, we centralized A and B first, determine the value of sigma one and sigma two, and then centralize C, D, E, F. Because sigma one and sigma two has been solved um, by, S, by SAT solver. So C, D, E, F can be centralized. Finally, centralized I, H, and G. The second method is to re reproject the global search, uh, strategy. The set, is, that the set solving process, process causes a lot of time overhead. In order to save this part of cost, the robots of the same strongly con connected component can use the same control strategy. So after synthesizing the communication strategy, the global strategy projected on robots which, which belong to the same strongly connected component, not on a single robot. We run some experiment practical scenarios and obtain some data. The data shows good performance regarding time, of, time overhead, state space, and communication traffic. 
we show that the global strategy, global strategy synthesis takes up major time of the method. And the orcas show this method can help robots significantly reduce the time space. For example, this is a global, this is the status space of the global strategy, and this is the status space of the local strategies. And all local strategies has number of input variables less than global strategy, which means less communication traffic. Let us summarize the work of this paper. We use GR1-based reactive synthesis to solve the problem of multi-robot cooperative control. The running trajectories of the control strategies can be regarded as a high-level control behaviors of the robots. And our method can be used as a framework of multi-robot system comparison to complete the tasks. For the future, there are two pieces of work. The first is to re reduce the time complex to deal with dynamic changing robots, robots or even global tasks. Um, for the second, um, we plan to propose a language that is easier to describe uh, multi-robot specifications. Above is my report. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much. Thanks for the uh, wonderful talk. So do okay. we have any questions to ask to the author of paper 63? Okay, so I have a couple of questions. Um, so as I know, there are uh, many rule-based systems that have been developed for cooperated robots. So yeah. how is your approach different from those existing approaches? Um, I think I met my method uh, um, um, combine the um, reactive synthesis and the uh, distribution synthesis. My, my work is first is based on the GR1 synthesis and uh, get the global uh, strategy. And then the global strategy, uh, using the global strategy, uh, get the local strategy uh, generation. Uh, other work maybe is, uh, uh, maybe is uh, direct, uh, since this is a local strategy directly. Okay. Uh, Each robot yeah. has its own you know, local strategy and try to, to achieve the goal. So you, you are dealing with the global um, strategies and goals, right? In a cooperative manner. Uh, yeah. All right. <laughs> then, uh, Who's going to deal with the uh, synthesis and coordination of multiple robots? So for instance, uh, do we have any centralized controller among those uh, robots for the synth synthesis and you know our coordination of the robots? Um, we use uh, this, uh... The centralization method uh, is based on uh, this, fig this figure. Uh, local strategies, uh, the, uh, global strategies uh, can be same as a product uh, of local strategies. So uh, the centra centralization method can be uh, same as a product, uh, can be the process of the local strategy product production. Okay, yeah. So in, in practical environments, um, robots may have some different um, representations, uh, different terminologies, uh, different communication mechanisms, right? 
So uh, do you yeah. consider uh, having such heterogeneous robots uh, interacting with each other to achieve the common goal in the future? Uh, um, no. <laughs> <laughs> so you are showing that the robots no. actually have the same um, representation, right? Uh, sorry, I something I can understand. Okay, so so you you actually uh, represented the environmental conditions in um, rules, right? And and rules can be represented in different you know ways. And I believe that you actually assume the same common representation of the rules among the robots. Okay. Uh, here is another question. So what is the main difference between the local tasks and global tasks in multi-robot systems? Uh, um, global, no, local tasks uh, for multi-robot system, uh, the designers may um, must uh, um, design the connection manually for robots, in, for example, uh, robot one need to sense scan action and location action from robot two. And, uh, and this information is, uh, is designed by designers manually. But for um, global, global specification, there is no uh, connection between robots. And the collection is uh, generalized by the algorithm, not, not by the designer. So, so designer do not need to um, care about the connection. That is uh, our work. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, so thanks for the talk. Uh, th thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so the third paper is testing microservices architecture based applications, a systematic mapping study. <laughs> and it'll be presented by uh, Muhammad Wasim. So, Wasim. Uh, okay, so can you now share your screen and give a yeah. presentation? Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we Professor? can hear you. Yeah, thanks. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Professor. I am honored to have the chance to speak in EPSEC 2020. My name is Muhammad Vasim, and I'm from Wuhan University. I would like to present uh, uh, our latest work results on testing microservices application. We have conducted a systematic mapping study. So I hope uh, most of you guys are familiar with uh, microservices architecture. That is a relatively new architecture style come from service oriented architecture with an emphasis on compensation of small scale services implementation uh, that typically implement through DevOps and Agile. So basically microservices allow building complex application as a set of modular component or services and each module support a specific task that have a specific objective and use a well-defined uh, and uh, well-defined interface such as application programming API to communicate with other sets. And typically that is RESTful APIs. 100 and 1,000 of microservices may, in, may be included in large-scale MSA-based system. For instance, more than, uh, uh, if we uh, give the example of Netflix, if more than 500 microservices handle approximately two, uh, 2 billion API edges every day. Whereas WeChat system is uh, consist of 3,000 services uh, running over 20,000 machines. 
uh, this large number of microservices, intercommunication processes, dependency between each other, uh, among each other, and different kind of instance network communications and other kind of variable influence testing methodologies in microservices based applications. So uh, the, these kind of things also arise the, or pose the, some significant challenge for uh, testing due to their complex nature of and dynamic behavior. Uh, we have seen that academia and industry discuss many approaches for managing the testing complexity in microservices based application. Mm -hmm. However, systematic studies like systematic reviews or uh, systematic mapping study related to testing approaches, especially for micro-based application is still in non-existent. We did not find the evidence about this. Therefore, our goal was to analyze the peer review literature concerning publication trends, research teams, approaches, and challenges, and specifically in the context of testing MSA-based application system. So the motivation behind uh, was uh, generally to synthesize uh, the testing approaches and uh, uh, their uh, uh, publication trends, uh, challenges related to testing approaches in context of microservices based system. Uh, for that purpose, we have uh, used the ma uh, systematic mapping studies approach. And uh, first of all, we identified three main research questions. The first question was related to what are the existing research themes on testing MSA-based application and how they can be classified and mapped. The aim of this research question was to establish, uh, establish for a systematic analysis of the existing research MSA-based application through our taxonomy themes and sub-themes. In this regard, thematic analysis approach uh, we have used uh, uh, for identification of primary studies. The another question was related to identification of testing approaches and tools. This research question aims to collect the uh, testing methods, tools, and other proposal that are used by, are proposed by, uh, in the primary studies. And the third question was related to identification of testing related challenges uh, that have been reported in the primary studies over the years. This question have a two multi-phase. The first, we will ide uh, we, uh, we identify the challenges and then we analyzed uh, what kind of challenges are continuously evolving, are continuously present uh, in a study that published in a different years. The next uh, phase was about the search of the primary studies. Uh, we divided our search in a two phases. In the first stage, we uh, conducted the primary search in which we have executed the, the predefined uh, search string. In a second phase, we do the snowballing. Whenever we reached on a, some certain number of primary study after uh, analyzing their, uh, after uh, screening through uh, studies titles, uh, through reading their abstract, through detailed study and applying inclusion and exclusion criteria. On those study, we got uh, some certain number of studies. And uh, then we performed the backward and forward snowballing on their studies. And we found some other studies. So the applying uh, here, uh, we, uh, we set the inclusion and exclusion criteria. That is basically based, uh, uh, revolve around three key steps in which first uh, we see if the study uh, provide the information related to research theme, uh, testing approaches and testing challenges. So we consider those kind of studies. In the next, uh, basically the next uh, item that was involved in a research method, it was about uh, deciding about uh, uh, databases and uh, also establishing a search string. Uh, we tried to uh, uh, establish the simple search string that basically provide us uh, as much as study related to microservices and testing. Uh, we use the different style of writing uh, microservices with wildcard and uh, that was connected through the R operator and we also uh, only focus on uh, testing with the wildcard. So basically we got uh, uh, maximum study by using this search string. Uh, search string. So we uh, 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 executed this search string 
on seven popular databases that basically uh, used for conducting systematic mapping study research in the domain of computing, more specifically in a software engineering. The another uh, important uh, uh, concept that we have, uh, uh, sorry, research method uh, we have used uh, in uh, 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 our study, it was about uh, thematic classification. Uh, we performed thematic uh, uh, classification in a six step. In the first step, we uh, got familiarization with the data. In second step, basically we generate the different code from the qualitative data. That was basically qualitative data. In third step, we uh, combine those uh, uh, codes and we try to provide the theme that basically uh, was representing the good uh, are well enough name for uh, 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 for uh, representing a different uh, uh, course. In a fourth step, basically we review the themes. In this theme, uh, there was a two researcher involved, and then the other researcher was come and we pro uh, performed the some brainstorm session. And uh, during that uh, uh, brainstorming session, we define the different naming for themes. And lastly, we produce the report for those themes. So uh, now we will present our uh, some important finding related to, uh, that we have got from our study. First of all, I would like to present about uh, demographic information. Uh, basically, we obtained a total of uh, 33 primary studies from 2015 to 2019. Uh, since, uh, more specifically, November 20, uh, 2019, to see a significant, uh, we see the significant increase in the number of publications related to testing of microservices application from 2017 to 2019. Uh, we also identified a uh, research type of primary studies that show 48.5% of the primary studies related to proposal of solution, or we may say that that was a solution proposal. That means um, studies propose a solution technique, its relevance to testing MSMS application, a full, not a full blown validation. Uh, the rest of the uh, uh, study was characterized as a validation research, evolution, uh, evaluation research, and opinion paper. The, we also identified the research method that was used in the primary study. Uh, the leading research method that was used in a primary study, it was about uh, case studies. And then we find that um, several studies that choose the experiment for uh, validation uh, or evaluation of the proposals. And we found only 6.1% that it was roughly uh, around two studies that are based on the surveys. And a significant number of studies does not uh, ex uh, explicitly mention the research method that was used in a primary study. It was nearly 21.1%. Or we roughly, we can say seven out of 32 studies, 33 studies we got it. <clears throat> so here are the results uh, of uh, our first research question that was about research themes. We identified five, uh, five major research themes, including uh, automated testing, architecture, DevOps, uh, and CIA, and performance and modulus based testing. I will uh, briefly explain about uh, these research themes. Uh, in automatic testing, basically, this theme covered the studies which discuss specific testing strategies via automated testing. In the architecture based uh, a theme in this theme basically uh, studies uh, are related that focus on using the architecture artifact for example architecture components or a quality assurance attribute to test msa based application system in a third uh, theme basically uh, this theme includes those studies that report uh, testing approaches and tools uh, uh, techniques based on application in devops or continuous integrations third Basically, this theme uh, deals with the quantitative behavioral aspect of testing. Uh, the result of primary studies related to this topic or this theme is shown that the quantitative performance testing, mostly in the production phase of MSA-based application development. Lastly, the, the last theme was related to model-based testing. So we uh, found uh, several studies that uh, basically uh, 
dis uh, discuss the use of model based testing approaches uh, for in the context of micro uh, microservices based system this uh, our second research question was about testing approaches and tools we have identified 41 testing approaches uh, from 33 primary studies that mainly discuss the MSA based application from uh, different aspects. The aim of, uh, so the mainly uh, the leading strategies that we have identified, it was about the integration, it is integration testing of the microservices based system and the unit testing of microservices based system. So the 12th study basically discuss about uh, uh, integration testing and the nine test uh, uh, studies discuss about the unit testing system. Uh, I will briefly explain about um, integration testing and unit testing here. The aim of integration testing verified the correct assembly between uh, the uh, different component. In particular, it verify the interaction through their interfaces uh, ex uh, to an external component to cover the established functional adjust the non-functional requirement, etc. And about the a unit uh, testing, uh, this testing isolate part of the codes and verify if focused on validating the behavioral uh, aspect of the system. Uh, in the same question, we also identified that uh, some tools that basically was mentioned in the primary studies. Uh, we have identified the uh, uh, five tools. Uh, Junior, like uh, for example, JSON and mock pack element and another one tool. This tool basically uh, uh, used to test MSO based system. We also classify these tool in a different categories. For example, JSON was using for the unit testing and integration testing. We have used another tool. So here I would like to mention that these are the tools that are also used to uh, evaluate uh, the other kind of system, except the microservices, for example, it could be used for service-oriented system, and it could also be used for uh, microservice uh, uh, component-based system. Our third question was related to challenges. As I mentioned, uh, uh, with the goal or aim of the research question, we did uh, the two things in this question. First. Uh, we identified different kind of challenges that was associated uh, with testing uh, microservices based system. And then we see the evolution of those testing uh, challenges. For example, we have identified these uh, seven, uh, seven or eight challenges here. And this uh, among these challenges, we saw that uh, when we plotted the testing, uh, uh, different uh, uh, testing evolution on the, this bubble chart, so we, got, uh, we saw that the automated testing is basically evolved continuously from 2015 to 2019. It also shows that uh, the people are usually, uh, researcher or practitioner are mainly focused on these testing techniques. So the, uh, this was basically our uh, finding related to, mic, uh, 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 related to testing of microservices, uh, challenges related to microservices system. So here I will provide uh, some takeaway messages uh, based on our study, our key findings of our studies. Uh, we have found that researchers are putting more efforts in proposing and implementing testing approaches for MSA-based application in context of automated testing to choose of architectural artifacts and DevOps and continuous integration approaches. The most frequently mentioned testing approaches that we have identified is about integration and unit testing, which are also used to test monolith and service-oriented test system. Our another finding, key finding is related to several novel testing approaches are proposed to test MSA-based application. But whatever we found, however, we found that uh, these testing approaches are not applied to real-world MSA-based applications. So we can say these uh, kind of uh, newly developed approaches are only tested in a laboratory uh, systems, or we can say that these are testing approaches are only testing of small scale or tie example of microbiome system. Uh, we also observe that the lack of dedicated tool support to test MSA based applications, because we did not find any tool that specifically designed or developed uh, to test MSA based application. 
these are the some other uh, uh, these uh, these uh, tools are a general purpose tool okay we we found that there is a growing interest to address automated testing challenges and intercommunication testing challenge between microservices over the years so uh, here i will conclude my work our paper present a systematic mapism study regarding testing approaches used in msa based application we obtained 33 primary studies out of 2,481 retrieved articles from seven di uh, different databases. The result revealed that during 2019, there was an increase in the number of publications related to testing approaches used in MSA-based application. And the major focus of our study was about research theme identification, uh, testing approaches identification, identification of challenges and their evolution related to testing of MSA-based application. Uh, here we plan uh, in the future work, as a future work, we, are, uh, we, were, we have a plan to investigate the general purpose testing approaches for MSA-based application, knowing the industrial reality concerning testing for MSA-based application through our industrial survey, and extending this systematic mapping study by including gray literature to identify the gap between research and practice. So more specifically, we can say the uh, gap between uh, academia and industry for testing approaches. Uh, that's all from my side. If anyone have a question, please welcome. Thank you very much. So do we have any questions for people 113? Okay, so I have a question. So it's quite surprising that there have been already like 10 papers published in 2018 and 2019. Um, I think it's too few. <laughs> so why do you think um, there have been, you know, not many papers published on testing microservice uh, architecture uh, based, based software? Yeah, uh, it's uh, actually, uh, it depends on the nature of primary study. We conducted a systematic mapping studies. So I did not claim that uh, we uh, don't have a, a testing related paper. I claim that uh, we don't have systematic mapping studies on testing of microservices based systems. So based mm -hmm. on those papers, basically, as you mentioned that 2018, 17, uh, sorry, sorry, 18, 17, and specifically in 19, uh, based on those papers, we have conducted about this systematic mapping study. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and you also found that you know intercommunication testing is one of the challenging issues, right? Yeah, and exactly. Did you figure out you know why it's one of the most challenging issues? Yeah, actually, this was not the scope of our study, but we are further investigating that. Uh, there was a, a several things that involve intercommunication. For example, uh, we need to keep as much as simple the microservices for uh, keeping uh, for uh, getting a maximum cohesion from that. So how we are going to uh, uh, how we are going to establish the very less link between microservices? So this kind of challenge is involved in that. So as I mentioned that this was not the scope of our study, but still there was a many reason that should need to investigate why the intercommunication is challenged for testing of microservices. All right, thank you very much. Thanks for the great talk. Yeah, thank you, Professor. Thank you. All right, so our uh, fourth paper is UML-based modeling and analysis of 5G service orchestration. And the paper will be presented by um, Ashal Lata uh, Kunapili. So now, Mr. Wasim, you can unshare your screen yeah. so that yeah, the next paper can it. present it. Mm, hello, everyone. Are you able to see my screen? Uh, yes, please. Okay. Please go ahead. I'll just switch to the presentation mode. Uh, is it okay now? All right. Okay. Um, okay, well, very good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to one and all. And welcome to my presentation. 
uh, uh, my name is Ashala Dakunapilli and I am a PhD student working in the formal modeling and analysis of embedded system group at Maladalan University. And today I'll be talking about my paper, UML based modeling and analysis of 5G service orchestration. So let's move to my presentation. So as the title suggests, my paper is talking about the hot 5G technology. So the first obvious question that comes into my, uh, all of our minds is why do we need 5G? Isn't 4G just enough? Well, let's try to look at some of the application use cases and try to identify if the existing 4G suffices. The first application that I would like to talk about is the case of autonomous cars that will dominate our roads in few years from now. For such kind of uh, applications, what we need is a low latency, reliable communication. Say for instance, they need to do their path planning, they need to do their collision avoidance, they need to talk with the other cars to find out their position. All of them need to happen in a split second. Can the existing 4G network provide these kind of reliable, low latency communication when a lot of cars are running on our roads? A question mark. The second kind of application that I would like to talk about uh, is the case of video gaming, teleconferencing, uh, and uh, browsing of ultra high definition videos, which require a very high broadband. When a lot of users are using these kind of applications at the same time, can the existing 4G network provide the kind of uh, service that it intend to do so? Again, a question mark. The third kind of applications which I'd like to present is, uh, is due to the development of Internet of Things technology. We know that a lot of devices are getting connected to the internet and uses the internet technology for sending their information. When such a scenario arises and when the number of device connectivity is increasing over and over and again, can the existing 4G network cope up with this kind of scenario? Again, a big question mark. So the conclusion that follows from this kind of uh, scenario analysis is that if we have a single network like that of 4G, which supports these variety of applications with uh, different requirements, it is not a feasible solution. Uh, so what 5G brings about is a concept called network slicing. So as the name suggests, uh, what network slicing do is to slice the network into different logical networks that is suitable for your particular application. Say for instance, if you have your uh, enhanced mobile broadband, if you need a high broadband, you have a, a logical network that is assigned to you that you can send information. Uh, and if you have an application like uh, which requires massive connectivity, you can use a logical network that is specifically catered for you that allows massive connection density. Or if you have this ultra reliable low latency communication application, you have a network slice that is dedicated to you. Uh, this is good, right? Okay, so- no, uh, so, uh, sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt your presentation, but we cannot yeah. see the presentation slide properly. So we still see the cover page. Okay. Uh, I don't know what's the problem because it's. Oh. Uh, uh, can you see it right now? The slide, uh, page three? Yeah, we are seeing something, but um, not the presentation um, screen. Okay. Uh, Right okay, now, now we, can, we can see the, the yeah, correct one, yeah. Okay, 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 great, yeah, yeah. Uh, so would you like to start uh, from the first slide or should I continue? I think you can just continue. Okay, okay. So as I was talking about, 5G introduced this concept called network slicing, uh, where which is a kind of a logical network that is dedicated for your particular application. Say, for instance, if you have a mobile broadband application, which requires a high bandwidth, you can use a logical network that is, uh, that is dedicated to you. And similarly, you can use these logical networks for any kind of application requirements that you have. Uh, there are some standardized slices which is defined by a third generation partnership project and that serves these individual kind of applications and they are enhanced mobile broadband to support high bandwidth application, massive machine time communication to support high connection density, uh, 
uh, ultra reliable low latency communication to support these low latency and reliable communication like that of these autonomous cars application. And there is also a new slice that has come up, which is called vehicle to everything, which connects, uh, which is specifically focused on automotive domain. So this is just an example of the applications that uses the slices of different category. Uh, now we know about the slicing concept, we would like to know what exactly a network slice comprises of. So ideally speaking, a network slice is actually a chain of network functions uh, that are virtualized and uh, they need to be interconnected in a specific way such that the application requirements are fulfilled and they need to be optimally placed in certain servers that are available in edge or cloud or wherever. We'll see this uh, in detail in the coming slides. So uh, how the particular VNFs are interconnected in a slice is actually defined by what is called a VNF forwarding graph. And there are many kinds of VNF forwarding graph. So for instance, uh, if you have the slice one, which is a VNF chain of V1, V2, V3, V5, V1, V2, V4, V5, we see it as a branching chain. It can follow either of the path that you can uh, see to fulfill its application functionality. Uh, there is also another kind of VNF uh, graph, which is a symbol chain, where you can see as that of slice two, which just follows V1, V2, V3, which is a symbol chain of VNF. And in this uh, work, we just, uh, for simplicity, we follow the VNF forwarding graph of category two, which is a simple sequencing chain. Um, now let's talk about uh, the 5G service orchestration problem. Uh, we have, uh, so uh, 5G is very well, uh, very good, right? So we have different use 5G user equipments or devices that can access the 5G network through their slices to get your application done. So let us try to analyze the scenario uh, in case of a real application where you uh, have a set of health bands that connect to a health slice uh, for sending some kind of alarms to a caregiver in case of a health deviation. So this is kind of an application that requires uh, real-time functionality. So we consider that the health slice is an example of uh, ultra-reliable low-latency communication slice. And we also consider an example of uh, a video slice, which can be accessed by several mobile phone users to stream their video. And uh, since it requires high bandwidth, we consider that it is an example of the enhanced mobile broadband slice. And we also uh, uh, consider a head slice as a simple VNF chain, which is given by uh, VNF1 two, three, and four. And a video slice is uh, a slice chain, which is given by VNF five and six. This just means that say for instance, for the video slice to have its functionality done, you need to execute VNF five in one server and then execute VNF six. Uh, so uh, these v, uh, VNFs have requirements, for instance, uh, they need some processing capability, they need some memory, they need some storage. Uh, such that they can such that they need uh, they can be facilitated to execute in some servers. And now let's imagine that uh, all of these devices share the same kind of resources. In resources, I mean that uh, we have an overlay network where we have a set of hosts, which are our virtual machines, uh, which are interconnected by the virtual links, as you can see here in the picture. Uh, uh, so each of these hosts have also resource constraints. So they have some limited processing capacity, some limited limited processing um, uh, storage, uh, limited RAM memory, and they have also constraints in terms of network functions it can host. So what are tasks? Is how do we actually uh, allocate these particular VNFs of different slices to different virtual machines? And how, uh, be, how respecting their resource constraints and how can we route the traffic between them respecting their VNF uh, forwarding sequence? Say for instance, in our case of video slice, let us imagine that uh, VNF5 is hosted in host one and VNF6 is hosted in, allocated in host two, uh, respecting their resource constraints. And uh, the, the, in order to fulfill the application requirement of a video slice, we know that VNF5 has to be executed first. So it gets executed in host one and now VNF6 has to be executed. So uh, VNF6, we know that it is in host two and we 
see that there is no direct link connection between host one and host two. So it needs to follow the path through link one and link three to reach to host two, or it might need to follow the path from link two, link four, or link three to reach to host two. These links which actually connect these particular hosts have also constraints in terms of the amount of data bandwidth that can be transferred to a, uh, through a particular link and also incur some additional latency. So for instance, um, if you need to travel from host one to host two via link one and link three, you need to in, uh, wait uh, for the latency requirement. Uh, you need to wait for the latency of link one and link three. So uh, this is actually a complex problem to solve. Uh, consider the amount of uh, hosts that we have, the amount of slices and the amount of user uh, equipments requesting for these particular slices. Consider the scenario where one particular host goes down and then you need to reallocate your VNFs, you need to reroute. So this is actually a very complex problem to solve. And in, when we looked at the literature, we found that there are many approaches that uh, deal with uh, solving this kind of uh, service orchestration problem. Uh, many of them deal with uh, allocating the VNFs to different hosts. Many of them deals with how efficiently you can route between different hosts such that your application constraints are met. Uh, for instance, uh, for a URLLC slice, you have requirements in terms of latency that needs to be met. For an enhanced mobile broadband, you need to meet requirements in terms of bandwidth. So how do we... Uh, okay, uh, really ensure that these slice requirements are met. So this is one of the key problems that we focus on this paper. So although we saw that in literature, there has been a lot of approach dealing with uh, actually providing the solutions to these kind of problems, we did not find many solutions actually validating whether a particular solution, that is a particular VNF allocation and a routing actually guarantees the performance. So this is where our contribution lies. So what we have done in this paper as we have proposed a UML-based modeling and analysis framework to uh, validate the 5G service orchestration problem. Uh, the first question is why UML? Uh, it's uh, simply because it's a widely accepted modeling framework in the industry. Uh, it's very easy to model and interpret uh, using UML. And uh, the second big reason is that it is very easy to extend. Uh, so one of the common extension mechanisms is using UML profile diagrams, which we discuss in detail uh, in our coming slides. But uh, one of the main disadvantage that we have is the, for the UML diagrams is that no unique and generally adopted formal semantics exists for these kind of UML diagrams. So that is one disadvantage. Uh, now let's talk about our UML modeling and analysis framework. Uh, it's named as UML 5G SO. So uh, it's actually a profile diagram extension uh, defined as a profile diagram extension to the existing UML 2.0 models. Uh, so uh, what we can do is we can a 5G engineer who uses this UML 5G service orchestration can actually model his service orchestration framework and analyze if it's uh, uh, right or wrong. And uh, we also do a logic-based analysis using use tool to identify that the particular service orchestration uh, uh, configuration actually satisfies certain constraints, be it in terms of resource constraints, be it in terms of latency, be it in terms of bandwidth, etc., which we'll see in detail in the coming slides. Okay. Okay. So uh, before showing the network, I'd like to uh, present the uh, a set of formal definition that we define for the 5G service orchestration systems. Uh, so consider the 5G service orchestrator as a system. We can see uh, the system as a set of inputs uh, given to the system. Uh, when a set of inputs is given to the system, the system will produce a set of output. So what are the inputs that you need to give to a 5G service orchestrator system? We need a set of slices, right? So these, what are these slices composed of? The slices are uh, composed of a set of VNFs, which uh, will Will serve some kind of network functions and we need to allocate these VNFs to a set of hosts which are our virtual machines uh, which are connected by a set of links. So if you have this kind of input what our service orchestrator uh, generates is an output which is a candidate configuration uh, which comprises of a VNF allocation where exactly each VNF is allocated uh, and 
a routing scheme that follows according to the VNF forwarding graph or sequence or whatever you use. Uh, we have also defined some tuple definitions for each of these individual components. For example, uh, if you see VNF, what uh, it actually contains is so it, it should um, refer to which network functionality it actually serves. It should mention how much CPU requirement it needs, uh, how much storage requirement it needs, whether it's a mobile edge computing VNF, whether it needs to be hosted in an edge cloud or a cloud, edge, edge or a cloud server, uh, and what is the execution time uh, that uh, is needed to execute a particular VNF. So in our case, this execution time is uh, actually the worst case execution time. Uh, so this is our system input. So I think now we are good to go to the next slide. Okay, I think, okay. So uh, this is the profile that we have developed uh, to represent the service orchestration problem. Uh, this profile respects all of the system definitions that we have seen uh, before. So as any profile extension uh, to UML, we have used what is called a stereotype. A stereotype is nothing but uh, an abstract class or a pattern that can be extended. For instance, we have a stereotype called host, uh, which actually shows uh, how much CPU resources uh, storage resource capability and whether it's a uh, mech enabled, so whether it's an edge host or a cloud host. Uh, so these are uh, the CPU resource storage resource, resource capabilities and MEC host are actually the properties and they are actually referred to as tagged values in your profile uh, diagram. And as you can see, we have defined stereotypes for uh, VNF, VNF forwarding graph, network slicing, uh, links, and we use a special category Category of VNA forwarding graph called VNA forwarding sequence. So you can see the relation. So VNA forwarding sequence is just a, a specialization of the VNA forwarding graph. So all the relations are uh, uh, mentioned in this particular profile diagram as well. Uh, okay. Now, before uh, seeing how uh, this profile can be applied to solve the 5G service orchestration uh, problem, I'd like to present an example of VNF allocation and routing. Suppose we have two hosts, uh, two servers, uh, which are virtual machines, uh, H1 being a cloud server and H2 being an edge server, uh, which is connected via link L1, virtual link L1. And host one has certain uh, capabilities to execute uh, the network function. For instance, it can execute network function of type C and it has some resource constraints. Uh, say for instance, it has a CPU of 30,000 gigabits per second and storage of 5,000 GB. Similarly, uh, the edge host has capabilities to execute VNF A and VNF B and uh, they have uh, a resource a resource constraint of uh, CPU. For instance, they have 2000 gigabits per second and uh, a storage of 500 GB. And the link also has uh, certain constraints as we have talked about earlier. So it can support a maximum data bandwidth of 200 GB. And if you use this link, you have to incur a latency of uh, five millisecond. Uh, now let's take the example of our video slice, which is an EMVP slice, which is composed of two VNFs, V5 and V6. And the requirement is that uh, it requires a bandwidth of 1000 MP and a latency of uh, 20 millisecond uh, for this uh, application. And we also have certain requirements on the VNFs. For instance, V6 is a category of VNF type C. It requires a CPU of 1000 Gbps, storage of 500 GB, execution time of 10 millisecond, and it's not an MVC VNF. And similarly for V5, it is of category VNF type A. It requires a CPU of 1000 Gbps, storage of 100 GB, execution time of five millisecond, and it's an MVC VNF. So, uh, the first step is how can we allocate uh, these VNFs to their respective host? Say, let's start from V5. So V5 is an MEC VNF. That means that it needs to be allocated to an edge host. Uh, we have one edge host, which is H2. So let's try to identify whether this has uh, e uh, enough resources to take this VNF5. So this has CPU of 2000, but this requires only a CPU of 1000. Good. So this requires, uh, uh, VNF V5 requires a storage of 100 GB, but uh, H2 has a storage of 500 GB. 
so it's very well and good. So you can, uh, H2 can be uh, allocated with V5. Now let's see where V6 can be allocated. Let's try to see uh, whether it's a MEC VNF or not, because we have just one cloud and one H4. So it's not a MEC VNF. So you, uh, ideally you can place this in a cloud server and let's see whether this cloud server has enough resources. So it has, right? Uh, so it has enough resources to take this VNF6. So we can place this VNF6 in uh, the cloud server. Now let's try to see if uh, this particular allocation uh, can actually meet the slice requirement. Uh, let's try with this bandwidth. So the routing is actually the, uh, for a part, for this particular slices, you have to execute V5. Then you have to use this link L1 to reach host one where V6 is located. So uh, what happens is that uh, the bandwidth requirement is 1000 MP, but the bandwidth that is actually supported by the link is 200 GB. So the, uh, the bandwidth constraint is actually met with this particular routing scheme. Now let's try to see whether the latency requirement met. So for instance, for V5 to be executed in host 2, it requires a latency of uh, uh, 5 millisecond, and then uh, execution time of 5 millisecond. And for in order to use link L1, it should have a latency of 5 millisecond. And then in order to execute V6, it uh, incurs a latency of 10 millisecond. So the end-to-end -end latency is actually uh, 10 plus 5 plus 5, which is 20 millisecond, and our latency requirement is met. So this is a simple problem when we try to analyze for a simple system like this. But think about the complexity when we have a lot of hosts and a lot of servers and a lot of slices. So uh, let's try to identify how our UML profile actually can be uh, utilized to serve a particular use case that we presented before. So you know that we had a host stereotype and we are dealing with uh, cloud and edge servers. So they are specialized in the cloud and edge classes. And we deal with three kinds of VNF functionality, same VNF A, B, and C. So they are the specialized classes. And we have a special category of VNF forwarding sequence called VNFSEC, which we use in this paper. And we uh, consider only about virtual links and virtual machines. So we have uh, a specialization of the link stereotype, which is uh, the virtual link. So now let's try to identify how we can represent this uh, 5G service orchestration configuration, uh, the input output that we saw in one of the previous slides. So we have these health slices, we have the video slice, we have the VNF forwarding graph, we have uh, the, the characterization of what each VNF is composed of, what are the requirements of each particular VNF. We have a set of hosts and we have a set of links that is connecting to the host. So our problem is how can we represent like uh, how a particular VNF is allocated to a particular host? Say, so for instance, if you see here, we see the example that VNF1 and VNF4 is allocated to host 2. So the allocation is mentioned, and uh, we also need the routing scheme um, for a particular slice. Say, uh, for instance, uh, the routing scheme of uh, uh, slice 1 is using path 2, path 1, and path 3. So as you can see in the figure. Uh, so uh, this object diagram representation is an overall representation of how a 5G engineer can actually represent his uh, 5G service orchestration candidate configuration. So our aim is if we have a solution uh, representation like this, how can we take the solution and verify whether this particular allocation and this particular routing is actually right? So for that, uh, we have a logic-based analysis using use tool. Suppose this is our uh, uh, UML diagram. This is how it can be encoded as uh, in, in the tool called use, which is a UML specification environment. So we have a stereotype host, which is represented as a class host with a set of attributes. We have a stereotype VNF, which is a class VNF with a set of attributes. And we see the allocation uh, relation between them. Uh, that is one host can be allocated to zero or more VNFs. So this is how we can represent the system in use tool. And we do some logic-based analysis. For instance, these are some of the constraints that we verified. Uh, for, for instance, we verified that the link is not overloaded. That is, uh, we count the number of links in a particular slice path. And we verified that at any point of time, the slice bandwidth is less than the link bandwidth, such that the link can support it. And we also verified that the host has enough storage resources. Uh, that is, for every VNF that is allocated to a particular host, we verified that the corresponding mean of storage requirement is less than uh, the host storage requirements. 
We also did some experimental evaluation. So for that purpose, we implemented a prototype of a greedy algorithm for VNF placement and routing to generate certain candidate configurations. And we fed this candidate configuration to our use tool, and we analyzed whether a particular candidate configuration actually uh, 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 meets the constraints or not. So that is the kind of experimental evaluation that we do. And um, now we come to the last slide, which is the conclusion and future work. So in this uh, presentation, uh, I have talked about a UML 5G service orchestration framework that will help us to model and analyze the 5G service orchestration problem. So we saw how uh, a profile diagram is built and how it can be used into a particular use case with the help of a class diagram and object diagram. So if you have this uh, object diagram, you can feed this uh, directly into the use tool and you can validate whether the particular service orchestration meets its constraints. So we have shown how the logic-based analysis works with this use tool. And uh, the advantages of this framework is that it's an engineering-friendly framework. Uh, as I said, the 5G engineer just has to work with the UML side and the logic-based analysis runs in the backend. Uh, but the problem with this kind of analysis is that it's a static worst case analysis. Uh, static because at each point you need to uh, uh, know what your system configuration is and you can give only one system configuration to your system and the system validate whether that particular configuration is met or not. But you don't, uh, in this work, we didn't consider about these dynamic slice requests, uh, the uh, host going up or going down anytime. And then uh, we didn't think about the scheduling at all. Uh, so we were just accepting VNF based on the processing power of a server, but in reality, a scheduling uh, algorithm runs in the server, and you can so you can schedule your VNFs one by one. So in reality, you can accept more VNFs to a particular server than uh, what it can be allocated uh, based on this paper. So in this next paper, in our future work, we consider all these uh, dynamic analysis uh, involving dynamic slice requests, VNF sharing, and scheduling, and we are proposing to use model checking analysis in the backend. Uh, that can validate all these possible configurations. So that is all about my slide. Thank you so much. All right, thank you very much. Um, so we have a couple of questions from the audience. And okay. the first question um, is about uh, your model of uh, relationship to the traditional orchestration model like WSBPL. So what is the relationship between your model and the orchestration model called BPL? Uh, okay, so uh, uh, the I think that all the traditional uh, service orchestrations. So this is not a, so. I I should uh, start my uh, answers just by focusing that this is not a framework that is intended to solve the service orchestration uh, problem, but in uh, uh, this is a model that is actually uh, uh, validating your service orchestrator uh, solution. So you can have any kind of uh, algorithm for VNF placement or any kind of routing that you can give to the system. So if you have a complete uh, system, like uh, you give me your input, you give me your output, you say that, say for this particular slice configuration, this is the routing and this is the VNF placement that you have. My system is actually validating whether you have the right output or not. It's not about uh, uh, the kind of solution that you propose. So this is one thing that, uh, so we are not looking uh, in detail into how service orchestration uh, so algorithms work, but in reality, we are talking about whether a service orchestration algorithm that is generated by any algorithms or any framework can actually be validated. So that is how it differs. So, okay, uh, so that, I, that means your approach needs to be worked with the traditional service coordination um, and methodology, right? Yeah, 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 of course, of course. Uh, the traditional service orchestration method, yeah, that is the beauty of this uh, framework. So you you just represent uh, your solution in terms of uh, an object diagram. And I think, uh, I think any approach, like any approach can generate a certain allocation. So a certain allocation and a certain routing, which can be represented uh, as an object diagram. And you give it to my system and your my system will actually tell you whether it's right or wrong based on the constraints that it has to follow. So I don't think it's uh, limited to any particular service orchestration framework uh, in general, but it's actually validating. 
So it's not right. focusing on which kind of uh, algorithm you use in the packet, but rather validating whether your uh, generated output or the generated configuration is actually right or not. So I think you can uh, plug it with any kind of service orchestration framework that you have. It's just that, and then when you have this UML, uh, if you do, if you miss some certain components, for instance, if you need to use a VNF forwarding graph uh, and uh, you no longer need sequence, you can extend your profile with this VNF forwarding sequence. So you can so since it's like a pattern based uh, model. Uh, so you can extend based on what you need, and then uh, you can represent whatever you need with, with the help of that particular uh, profile in, as an object diagram, and you can just feed to the system. So uh, the system will actually tell you uh, how uh, whether you have a feasible configuration or not. So this is something that has not been so much addressed in uh, literature because almost all of them are focused on what kind of, uh, how to solve this problem, not how to validate this problem. But when you have these critical slices and like URLC and uh, EMBB, it's very, and you have these dynamic, um, like any, anything that can happen to the network at any point of time. So if you have this kind of dynamicity of the system, it's very crucial that we try to do some kind of uh, modeling and analysis uh, as, uh, uh, as early as uh, possible. Say for instance, in the design stage to identify, is there any particular uh, uh, scenario that can breach these particular SLA requirements of the application? So that is where we are focusing in, uh, not in solving the solution. So yeah. you can uh, extend the framework in any way you want uh, to represent your solution. And uh, what my solution takes is uh, just take this, take your output that is generated from your particular service orchestration algorithm, be it anything, and then you give it my system and I can analyze and tell you whether it will meet uh, the respective requirements of that particular slice. All right, thank you very much. Yeah. Interesting yeah. talk, great, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah. So this is the end of this paper session and there'll be a short break and then we'll continue the next paper session at uh, 3.40 p.m. Thank you very much. Mm. Thank you very much for the, uh, to the um, speakers and Prof. Ko for hosting the session. Mm. Let's yeah. have, a, have a short break and we'll continue to the next, next part. It's the top security, reliability and privacy too.